Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our live edition of Ask Kyle. So Kyle is the expert brain behind APT training, and we're here to help you handle your hose, become the master in fluid power on site. So Kyle, we've got a bunch of questions come through for you, and I know we've already got a whole lot of listeners that were sitting there patiently waiting for us to, you know, finally get set up, but I had to check the surf and you know you had to do your hair i had to do so, my hair it's been done you had to beautifully do your hair. at the moment the pressure's on yeah, a little look, bit i love the, how you styled it the pressure is on so um i've brought out <laughs> the big hose to make sure that intended. we can handle the pressure absolutely there'll be plenty of puns and maybe some dad jokes to go as well oh my favorite my favorite okay so um in terms of questions have you got some that were pre-sent through or how about i jump on and be having a look at what's what's coming through live. I reckon let's have a look at that list that we've got and um, and we can rock and roll with it. Okay, amazing. So my first question that I have for you is, would you change a hydraulic hose out if it was sweating? Oof, this is a pretty scary question to be asked. And um, you know, it's, it's actually a pretty simple answer. Definitely yes. So I did bring my big hose so that we can talk about this a little bit. Um, obviously yeah, a right. hose is meant to keep that oil on the inside, so we don't want to have oil leaking out of it. Um, my, my catchphrase is the hydraulic system shouldn't leak. So most definitely if that hose is sweating oil, then definitely it needs to be changed out. Now the reason for that is that as we look down the inside of the hose there, we can see that there's a tube in the middle there. Everything else around that is just for strength. Now, if that tube is leaking, it's actually degrading that strength on the outside there and working its way through. So that sweating or that initial little bit of leak that's coming through the sheathing on that hose is actually the start of the, the leak that might turn into um, a jet of oil coming out. And um, that can lead to some pretty serious and scary um, injuries. We do have a safety DVD on that or a safety course, so you can actually check that out if you get to our website. Um, and there's some really gruesome photos and some pictures to look at. Um, and there's also a video on what it does to a leg of pork. Um, it's a waste of a great leg of pork, so I don't know why we'd do that, but um, most certainly you can see what it might do to your thigh or something else. So back to the original question, if that's sweating, get rid of it as soon as you can before someone gets hurt. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that one. That's a, a sweating hoses. Nobody wants a sweaty hose, no, right? No, only sweaty nope. guys. Okay. Only sweaty guys. <laughs> sweaty guys, okay. Sweaty hoses, no good. Beautiful. So let's move on to the next question I have for you. When idle, a swing shoot cylinder creeps out. What could be the cause? So this is quite a complex question, and um, I probably don't have a definitive answer on this one. Um, so well, I guess to, to clarify, a swing, sh swing shoot is just a, a something that moves and it's controlled by a cylinder. Now that cylinder might be um, leaking. There could be a problem internally in that cylinder and so internal leaks will cause it to creep. But there's also a complex control system that might be sitting behind that cylinder. So there might be a directional valve. Now if that directional valve has some internal leakage, a problem or anything else going on, then that leakage may cause the cylinder to creep when we're actually trying to keep it stopped. So firstly, we could go back to the actual directional control valve. Now we may actually have some load holding valves as well. Now load holding valves are there to hold the load separate to the directional valve. And so if those, if those valves are playing up, then obviously again, those cylinders may move. So I guess to, to get back to the core of that particular issue, We'd actually need a little more information on what else is in the circuit and in the system. But the things I would check firstly, are the directional valve for leakage, and there's a few different ways that that could be done. Um, certainly offline so that you don't have to um, do it while the machine's running. I'd be checking load holding valves if there's any there, and then I'd be looking at the cylinder and testing the cylinder for internal leakage. And I guess the very last one, which might seem really obvious, is to look for any external leaks to the system. So oil leaking out of hoses, out of fittings, could also be causing it to creep. So there's four things there that you could quickly and easily go and check. Um, but apart from that, we'd need a little more information if we were gonna check out what's actually going on there. 
just had to mute myself because I was worried that my wave sound was like overtaking you, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> okay, beautiful. So key things in, in that is we really need to go and double check and look at what the valves are. Definitely. Okay, perfect. So another question I have for you is how do you control the speed of a cylinder without changing the pump and the motor? To go to first principles on fluid power systems, the thing that actually makes the speed in a circuit is flow. We need pressure to move things and that gives us force, but what we need is flow to make things go. Another nice pun that I like to use or a bit of a dad joke. Now, flow thought, makes things go. I like this. Flow makes it go, yeah. Now, when we talk about flow making it go, we create flow with a pump, a hydraulic pump and a motor of some sort that drives that pump. Because we have fixed displacement pumps in our hydraulic systems, every time the pump turns over, it puts out a certain amount of oil, and that certain amount of oil gives us some sort of flow and therefore speed. So the question is, how do I change that speed without changing how much flow is coming out of the pump? Now, I spoke about directional control valves. So directional control valves can also meter the flow. And when we talk about metering the flow, we're, we're creating a resistance and we're not letting all the oil through to the cylinder. So that can slow it down a little bit. We can also put in line flow control valves, needle valves, or sometimes called speed valves or throttling valves, depending on where, where you work. Now these, again, like metering on the control valve, just restrict the oil that goes through and can slow down that cylinder. And then the final way that we can control speed in a simplistic form is we can bypass some of the flow off so that it, it goes somewhere else and we can use something like a pr priority valve or similar where we're actually pushing some of that oil somewhere else and just taking through the oil that we want to control the speed of the cylinder. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that when systems are designed, the designer has taken into account how things should work and a whole heap of other factors that might not be considered when you're just going to modify the circuit. So before we modify any system, it's really important to analyse that system, understand exactly what's been done, why it's been done and how it's working. And then what we need to do is decide on the best way to slow down the cylinder if we need to. So I've given three really good examples of how we might be able to do it. But before we modify any system, I can't stress enough, we need to actually analyze it and make sure we're doing the right thing so we don't cause any other problems down the line. Awesome. Um, and on that then, Kyle, where does someone learn to do that? Like, how do you, how do you learn how to do the analysis? What do you... It's, it's actually... I'm um, for us, it's been experience. So um, I've, I've worked in fluid power for about 20 years and, and my dad that runs runs the business with me, he's got... Stop it, um, you don't look old. May, may, maybe four or five decades of, of fluid power experience. <laughs> so um, you can shortcut it. We do run some courses on um, modifying fluid power systems. So that's um, at our diploma level and it's called Modify Fluid Power Systems. The reason that we run that course is all around making sure that you don't miss something. So... The reason, you know, I, I, I keep banging on about this one, and this one's really close to my heart. I see so often that people make a change in a circuit and they either create unintended consequences or they create a safety issue. We might end up with too much pressure, we might end up with an overpressure, and it can actually get to a really scary thing. So to get the best performance out of your system, to make sure that everyone's safe, you need to learn how to do it properly. And as I say, we do have a course that you can do on that. And um, we have a ball teaching that one because um, it's, it's all based on problems that we've seen in the field that we might have actually been through before. And um, we, we can see what's going to change and, and how people react to that on the way. Awesome. Awesome. And I, uh, I know that if uh, people get really stuck and they need an urgent answer and they haven't had a chance to be trained, you guys are on call, right? They can, they can call you up. We, You're we... like the Ghostbusters for hoses. <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. I like it. <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. Let me hit you with another question then. That was a great answer. Um, if Is there a flow control valve to regulate even flow to four cylinders at once? So I didn't, sorry, I don't know who the question came in from, but he's trying to make, or she, maybe she, 
uh, is trying to make operate two scissor lifts simultaneously to lift the rear of a truck up. Ah, so and I suppose you don't want one going fast and the other one going slow <laughs> and it'd be all the lopsidedness and then it's flat. Absolutely, yeah, we don't that flat. definitely wouldn't be a good thing. This is actually a really common thing to try and achieve in hydraulics. Um, and it, it's not an easy thing. So as the load changes on cylinders, the flow going to it can change. So in a, in a really simple form, we could um, use, the, use the control valves themselves and we could do it by eye. And, and try and keep things moving evenly. Now that's not a real, really robust way to make things work. Um, we could also put in some flow control valves and set those speeds. Now that can be a little hazardous if we want it to be relatively accurate in when we're doing that, because as the system changes a bit, a little bit of different load, slightly heavier, we move the truck in a slightly different position, then what happens is, is that that speed can change and um, as it changes, things move maybe to a scary point as well. And I totally understand this one. So then we move into some more complex solutions. Now, the first one is, is we, can use, um, we can use a flow divider. And there's two types of flow divider. The first one we've got is a spool type flow divider. And without getting into the nitty gritty of how it works, it will maintain a relatively even flow. So within a percentage range, maybe 10% going to two or four or, or even more different parts of the circuit. Now, these are pretty good, but they can give us some problems when we try to push flow in the opposite direction. So when we want to lower it, it might not necessarily work. And you know, while, while they work in, in really simple circuits, they can be a little hazardous. Or, you know, again, back to that changing the system, we need to be fairly cautious and conscious of what we're changing. Now, I have to say that and, and quite an unconventional view in the world is that one of my favourite ways to do this is using a flow divider, a rotary type flow divider. I happen to have one sitting here ready to play with. Um, now this, this comes from our training Here's kit. one I prepared earlier. Here's one yeah. I prepared earlier. <laughs> there isn't a set of steak knives though. Oh, I've got the steak knives in the van. <laughs> so I tell you what, then, the, the person who asked the hardest question today, I will send them a set of steak knives. Ooh, that could be interesting. <laughs> Accompanied with a hose. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favourites, and, and it can be quite an unconventional way to do things, is to use a rotary flow divider. Now, essentially what this is, is it's four pumps that are all mechanically linked. Now, this is only a two, but we could have another two on here. And we put one flow in, and then we get our three or our four or two or whatever it is out the other side. Now those four pumps are all equal sized. So whatever oil I put in there, because they're mechanically linked, proportionately they'll put the flow out. We can combine with these as well, so we can come back the other way and we can combine our flows. So it reduces some of the hazards and the problems that we might get with a spool type flow divider. Um, and the really big benefit to using one of these is that it reduces the load, or maybe that's not the right description, it distributes the pressure throughout the system. So if this port here needs more pressure than this one, then we actually see less pressure on the inlet because they're all mechanically linked and we get an intensification effect. Now, that intensification effect can be hazardous as well as helpful, it can be helpful where we reduce the overall system pressure on a, on a, on a complete system. It can be hazardous because we might get too much pressure and we have to design that into the system. So that's, while it's an unconventional, and the reason it's unconventional is that it's a relatively big lump of a component that we might have to put into a circuit. They can be noisy if they're not sized correctly. Um, they do chew up a little bit of power and a little bit inefficient, but generally not a lot. So unconventional kind of old school thinking and um, we've seen a lot of great success using something like this. The how hard is it to learn how to install something like that and set that system up being the old school unconventional way? <laughs> so the, the design aspects to that I guess for me I've been around hydraulics since I was um, down here somewhere you know maybe five or six and so about, back at my height yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe a little short so I guess for me, I've, I've had exposure to this old school thinking 
without knowing about it for quite a long time. Again, in our courses, we try to incorporate this kind of stuff into all of our courses, even from our very basic stuff, basically because there's a lot of old systems out there that new people are looking after. And without some of that old school thinking and understanding of why things are done, it's really hard to just go, oh, that's a stupid idea. We've got to use this new fangled idea and, and go for it. So we, we try to teach that in all of our courses that the old school thinking, the new school thinking, why each might be applied, why it might be used, um, but certainly not to discredit either way. Um, hydraulics has been around for many, many centuries. Uh, and you know, we've, we've got up in our, our meeting room some really cool pictures of some of the people, our forefathers of, of fluid power. And you know, the concepts and principles haven't changed a lot, certainly in the last 50 years or so. And so to continue on with that question about synchronising the cylinders, the next step and probably the most newfangled, so to speak, and the high tech one would be for each cylinder to have its own control valve and also its own monitoring, such as a, an, an LVDT or a, a transducer that tells a control system where that cylinder's moved to. And so then with the use of a PLC or a control system, electrically, using some smarts, the valves will control where it sits and make sure that it goes up at an even rate. That's certainly the most newfangled, you know, high-tech sort of version of it, but it could be a very, very expensive solution to a, a really simple problem that a flow divider might be able to fix. You know, we might spend two or three thousand dollars on a flow divider or ten thousand dollars on a control system to achieve, you know, maybe a tiny little bit more of um, accuracy. Okay, amazing. Well, that was a, uh, a very interesting answer and probably something that a lot of guys that are just new to fluid power or stepping into this may not have known as a solution. So thanks for that. Okay, next one for you. When holding a valve, how do you know if it's a left or right-handed adjustment? Ooh. So we spoke about load holding valves. Lefty, loosey, righty, tidy isn't always the case. Um, <laughs> so we spoke about load holding valves, and this is probably the, the, the place where it, it comes out the most is in counterbalance load holding valves. So they have an adjustment, and yeah, here's, here's one I prepared earlier. I've got a few of these. So counterbalance valves we use to hold a cylinder up, and basically what they are is, is a um, a pressure valve that holds, holds a certain amount of pressure in that cylinder or a certain amount of load. Now, due to the internal construction of how this valve works um, and these cartridge type valves, is the adjustment on this particular type, so this is a sun one, we may or may not be able to see that. Um, this one here is, is a sun version and just wholly and solely due to the construction of the valve internally, the adjustment is left-handed. So what that means is when I turn it clockwise, the setting actually reduces, and when I turn it anti-clockwise, the setting increases. Now that's backwards to most valves and most, I guess, logic that we would see in, in just that mechanical type world. The really hard thing about that is that I can have this one that's left-hand adjustment and this one that's right-hand adjustment. And Really, they're only two blobs. They don't look a lot different to each other. They're just two blobs of, of metal. And you know, certainly once they're in the system, all we're going to see is those, those top bits there. The only sure way to know which one is which, and whether it's left or right hand adjustment, is to find the part number on the side of the valve and find the data sheet for that. And that data sheet will tell you whether it's left or right handed. You can do it by experimentation. But if, that's, if that load holding valve is holding something up and you start to adjust it incorrectly, it may fall. If someone's in the way, it may fall on top of someone. So it's, it's actually really, really important to get the information first, then come to the system and make any adjustments. Um, there's a whole procedure around setting it, um, load holding valves. It's not just as simple as turn it and it'll all be okay. And quite often, we recommend that load holding valves are actually set external to the operating system. And so what that means is isolate the system correctly, 
make sure all of those loads are held and restrained mechanically so that they're not going to fall. Take that valve out, put it in a block on a test rig, set the pressure that needs to be set, bring it back and put it into the system. Then we know that it's set to the pressure that it's supposed to be set to as per the design intent. Now remember I said these are a pressure valve, so the design intent is to limit the maximum force that that load's going to hold as well. So we want to make sure that we're taking into account all of those sorts of things as we change those settings. Well, there's a, that, that kind of dovetails into the next question I had. Load holding valves, would an incorrect setting cause them to bounce? Oh, most definitely. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, that one, where the setting of the valve itself. The, the, these load holding valves are actually quite a complex kind of piece of equipment and applying them to a system can be quite tricky in the design phase, let alone in the field or, or retrofit into an old system. Originally, and, and even now, quite a lot of equipment doesn't use load holding valves or counterbalance valves, and they're also sometimes called hose burst valves. So a lot of systems just relied on um, the DCV, the directional valve, and that's how we held the load up. When we start adding these into the system, we actually use what we call a pilot ratio. And the reason we use a pilot ratio is so that we can open these reliably and at a lower pressure than we need, than we actually hold the load with. So to get to a really condensed kind of answer to this, because of that pilot ratio and dependent on the operating pressure, if we set these wrong, they can open, close, open, close. And so if you imagine, um, I'll use my big strong arm here to hold the load up and I've got a, a, a like a teacup, and what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm holding that load up with a cylinder. Now if I pop open a load holding valve and it's incorrectly set, it drops. And then the pressure increases and it closes, and then it drops. And so it's opening and closing that valve because we've got that ratio incorrectly set. So that's a really short version of why it actually opens and closes. So to get back to the actual question itself, an incorrect setting can create that jerking movement, but also that pilot ratio, because it's only on one of those letters in there, just one of them, then it can easily have that we've put the wrong valve in and now all of a sudden it's, it's going to perform incorrectly. Mm. So yes, it can be a setting, but it could also be incorrect valve. So we need to know what the history of the system is first before we rapidly go changing settings. Um, I'm going to digress a little bit away from that question a little bit. It's really, really common when we're troubleshooting a hydraulic system to immediately go to changing things. I'm going to change the settings. I'm going to increase this. I'm going to decrease this. And it's a common problem that we see or a common attitude that comes through in the troubleshooting of hydraulic systems. So it's, it's actually really, really important to take a breath, take a pause, like most things, and think about what has happened to this point. Has there been some other maintenance done on the system? Has that valve been changed before we immediately go to adjusting things? So just to digress away from that, make sure that we understand what's happened in that system first and then start thinking about what we might need to do to troubleshoot the system. Yeah, beautiful. So getting, getting the history on it and really understanding what's going on to do the diagnosis before rushing ahead and yep. just, yeah. Nice okay, beautiful. Um, how does one get that knowledge? Like, so how does one learn just about the basics of it, fluid power and, and what you should check first? Like, It really comes firstly with learning how to read schematics because without the system schematic. Well, schematics, my favorite. <sighs> just the word. I love the sound. Schematics. It sounds unreal. So it, schematics can seem quite confusing. It sounds fucking hard. <laughs> it sounds really hard. We, we put together a, a symbols book so that people can start to break apart. Um, once you start to understand symbols. It's not as hard as I think it is, is it? No, not at all. It, it <laughs> becomes pretty easy to understand how it works. So the first step is actually being able to read the schematics and then secondly, understanding some, some basic principles about um, troubleshooting, where problems might be. And we always teach 
straight from the schematic. Where, where could those problems be without just diving straight in? And then it actually comes back to some common sense as well. What's the easiest thing to physically touch, change, adjust, check? So um, on a piece of paper that's a schematic, you know, my schematic just has a whole bunch of symbols on it that, you know, it's really easy on a piece of paper to go, oh, just go and check that thing. But that thing's, you know, 15 ton and, and weigh, you know, is three metres long. It's not real easy to actually just test that one. So on a piece of paper, it can be really easy, but then you've got to use some common sense stuff. So we, te we teach that in all of our courses and, and really we actually teach the troubleshooting stuff right from the start to the end of all of our courses. It's, it's an inbuilt part of just about every step in the, in the training is learning how to troubleshoot each and in individual component, part of a system and type of system. Awesome. What I'll do is I'll get, um, I think we've got the team on board. I'll get them later on to drop a link because I know you've got a um, schematics booklet that you're giving away for free, right? So if anyone just wants the basics and they want to sort of start getting handle it. I was going to say to people if they wanted to write the word schematic into the comments, but I can't spell that, so I'm not going to try and make other people do it. <laughs> or symbol. <laughs> symbol. symbol. If you can spell symbol, put, symbol, put symbol that in as well. Symbol book we'll in the we'll comments. <laughs> And uh, the guys on the guys will get that too. <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. Anything else on on that topic that you think that if they're asking those questions, they should also know? Not a lot. It's it's just um, really making sure that you've got some underlying knowledge before you go diving in. Um, hydraulics seems really simple, but it can be quite complex, and it can quickly get very very dangerous if you're not sure what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, let's move on to the next question then. Um, how does a pump replace the directional valve in a closed loop system? Oh, this is fun. I could talk for hours on this and um, yeah, we, we've just actually finished putting together a course that goes for about two days on, on this exact topic. It's, it's actually pretty exciting and, and interesting. So we'll go to a really condensed version and try and do it in only a few minutes. In a closed loop system, essentially what we do is we have a pump that puts oil straight out to the motor and that, that motor, the outlet from the motor, goes straight back to the pump. So that's why we call it a closed loop. There's no directional valves, there's nothing else in there to control how fast or which direction it's going. The way we actually do that is in the pump itself. Here's one I prepared earlier. This one's really <laughs> heavy. <laughs> so I don't want to stand here talking about it for too long because it's just too heavy. Yeah, this is a standard. Oh, come on, you're going to use those. It's sun's out, guns out, sun's Kyle. Sun's out, let's, guns out, definitely. Get the guns out, bro. <laughs> so this particular one is a, a piston pump that's used in an open loop system. And the way that it works is when we want to deliver oil, the swash plate actually moves to an angle and it delivers flow out, out the pump. And when we're back in the neutral position there, while it's still spinning, because the pistons aren't moving in and out, it delivers no flow. In a closed loop system, we actually change the way this pump works. And essentially what we do is we allow the swash plate to move both ways. So it can move that way or that way. And what that does is it changes where the oil's going, whether it's going out the A port or out the B port. And we no longer have a, a pressure and a suction port we just have two working ports, plus some other stuff that we talk about other times. And so when the swash plate's moved this way, we might be delivering flow to the A port, and so it's going forward, and the more that we move that, the more flow that comes out, the faster it goes. When we come back to the middle, we have no flow, and then as we move it back the other way, we get more flow going in the other port, and so it'll go in the reverse direction. So in a really, really condensed way, that's how we control the speed and direction in a closed loop system, as opposed to using valves in an open loop type system. Oh, and I'm glad to put that down. <laughs> you did well to hold it for that long. I'm, I'm proud of you. And especially because I know that you've, uh, you've only just installed the gym into the workshop. The gym so... is just over that corner over there. And, the, um... the gym is over here, yeah. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I know that you were working on that as a, uh, a course recently for the closed loop system, right? Yeah, we, we've just put together, a, it's, it's essentially 20 hours of training just on closed loop systems. Um, you need to have some fundamental inf 
knowledge before you get into that, but it's um, it's super fun. I've actually got some guys working over the back corner here working on closed loop systems now. So they're playing with amplifier valves and closed loop control and all of that sort of stuff right now up in the back of the Oh, uh, awesome. So that's if uh, anyone wants to know more about, yeah, I could, I could hear them. Um, so if anyone wants to know more about closed loop, just comment closed loop help and uh, we'll make sure that we get you some information on that. I have one more question for you at the moment. Um, this one I reckon is going to be interesting. It's more of a, I think it's more of a story for you to tell. What's the coolest thing you have achieved with hydraulic power and what was the process or components you used to achieve it? That's, um, that's a really interesting question. We've, um, we've done lots of really cool projects. Um, it'd be very hard to choose just one that I'd say is my absolute most interesting I guess probably the one that, that's most recent to us would be um, a, a um, I, I guess what it was called was a, a mobile manufacturing unit which um, for the mine sites they they use a lot of explosives um, those explosives are made up of, of a whole heap of different pieces of, of chemicals and, and stuff I guess is the best way to describe it um, I can't give away too much about that information. Obviously, it's it's quite secret. <laughs> um, even even we don't know too much about it. So, it, you know, but it uses you know maybe four or five different things that all get mixed together that creates um, the the rapid oxidising agent that's used for for blasting in mines. Now, obviously, it can be pretty hazardous to take that around. You know, we're talking tons and tons of this stuff. It's it's pretty hazardous to cart that around ready to go so to speak ready where it may go boom rapidly oxidize i'm told it is so they use these mobile manufacturing units where they hold on a truck on a single truck all the individual things all separated and they mix it all together and then deliver it sort of all in one go so that that's a that's a recent project that we've worked on um the, the, the design of that system it's it was kind of really, really complicated and really, really not all at once. Um, the important part was the accuracy of the system so that the mix of the product could be right. And that mix changes quite regularly. So, you know, I think there's 20 different products that this particular company makes. And so that mix is different for each of those products and delivered slightly differently and also delivered at different speeds. So the smart bit for us is more in the control system that wasn't our job. But we put together all the, the design to, um, to make the hydraulics do the hydraulics bit. And I guess for us, the, the really cool part of that was in the redesign of that, we improved the overall efficiency of the system. Um, and you know, to me, that's, that's pretty important. And Jade's sitting there in the, you know, got the beautiful ocean in the background and looking after the environment. It's actually really important, even as an engineer, to be thinking about, can I do this more efficiently? And so we've, we, we set up a system that uses a lot less fuel on the diesel engine than previous versions of it. So yeah, it's more efficient, le less impact on the environment as much as anything else. So that's probably at the moment, the one that sits pretty high on the list of, of cool projects. Um, so much work went into analyzing it. There was so much data to understand. There's been some testing, some, some data logging of previous machines, data logging of new machines. There's so much has actually gone into this particular project. And it, you know, it, the whole team was involved. You know, Brock did a lot of the heavy lifting at the start to try and analyze how things worked. And you know, was it the right motor? Was it the right actuator? Did we have the right flows? So you know, even, even for Brock, there was a big learning experience in, in getting to how this system works and how we can actually improve it. So, um, as an improvement project, this is probably the one that I've, I've enjoyed the most in recent times. I love it. It sounds really fascinating too. Like it, there's some, some consequences there. Shit doesn't go right. The, the, um, I suppose the pride of making something work more efficiently and knowing you're doing better for the environment. And yep. I'm, I'm sure that's saving the client time and money as well. So everyone's, everyone's a winner in that situation. Absolutely. And that, that's the fun for us. The fun is learning all different products, all different things, how different machines work. You know, that's the stuff that really lights us up as a whole team is how does this stuff work? How do we, 
you know, how do we achieve this outcome? How does this system work? How does this machine work? And you know, then when we get the opportunity to build a better mousetrap, how do we make it better again? Is just you know so much more fun. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's lots of guys listening or lots of people listening um, that are you know dabbling in the hydraulics or they're they're the fluid guy, fluid power guy on site that would love to be able to set themselves up and be that person that gets the pat on the back for for designing these systems or diagnosing and, and making the adjustments. So what I'm going to say at this point, guys, is if you're interested in learning more about how you can be lifted to being the fluid power guru on site uh, or elevating your knowledge in this area, helping create a safer site, just stay on the line with us for a second. Um, I'm going to ask Kyle a few questions about how you can um, connect with APT and potentially the courses that they've got and how they can help you. So anyone else that's watching live that you feel like you've had all your answers uh, to, given to you today, you're free to, to bounce and we send you off with love. Um, and if you if you do want the free symbols book, just comment below. But otherwise, everyone else stick with me. Because Kyle, I just want you to tell us a little bit. I know you and I have been working together. I didn't really tell everyone at the beginning of this call, I am the swimsuit CEO for APT training. Uh, so Kyle and I work really closely on the different programs that are getting delivered, looking at what the market's really needing, what's happening out there and the demand. And most importantly, during the COVID shitstorm, what what sites need, what customers need and what the employees need to to keep themselves progressing even when we can't be fully connected or, you know, doing things as usual. So I know that this program is something we started developing uh, a few months ago to fit a need in the market based on demand of what's going on. So can you just give us a bit of a walkthrough? What are the key outcomes from the Fluid Power Program? So it's, it's actually quite interesting at the moment that the Fluid Power Program that um, we're talking about, that way about... 15 metres, Graham's sitting there delivering one of those sessions now in another room. So it's actually live right now. So it's pretty funny to sort of talk about this. So <laughs> the fluid power program is designed just to get you moving in fluid power. So, um, you know, unload the pressure. There's that pun again. Give you some, some foundational knowledge so that, you know, firstly, if, if, this isn't your, if this isn't your thing, if you don't normally work in fluid power, so that when you're talking to the people that do do the fluid power stuff, you know the right questions to ask and you know how to get the right answers. So if you're supervising a team that looks after fluid power, if you're relying on contractors, you know, we're running this program so that you can have that underlying knowledge and, and start to join the dots between what's going on and what you're seeing and what they're telling you. So that's not to accuse anyone of keeping secrets from you, but it's so much easier to communicate when you have enough information behind. So we start with safety. All of our courses, safety is the first one that we talk about. If you want the safety course, we give away the safety course. But if you haven't done it, that's our first module. We always do safety. In that safety course, we talk about what's happened, some previous incidents, things that have happened in the industry. And um, you know, it, it can be quite scary to see how some things play out. So that's, that's the first thing that we do. In the course, we then work through things like basic fundamentals. Yeah? the boring physics stuff that we didn't listen to in high school. Um, you know, we'll never ever use this stuff. Why would we listen? Why would we need to worry about physics? But it's actually really, really important to understanding how that system works. Then we move into good old schematics and symbols. Components, we talk about each individual component, how they work, what they do, why they're in a system. And then we move further on into some troubleshooting um, and, and that's really where we wrap up in the, in the tr basic troubleshooting using schematics, how would we troubleshoot a particular system. So you'll start with um, safety and you'll work through and you'll get to a point where you've got an understanding and you can have communication, you can talk to people about how the system's working and be confident that you know what they're telling you and what you're trying to tell them is, is, is the right things. Yeah, beautiful. So great foundation level. Um, what I uh, what I do love is though we we try to come up with a no brainer price, right? And we're like, okay, what's because this is like the basics, and this we want to make sure people are safe and that they're feeling comfortable and that they're able to start progressing through with their careers as well. So the no brainer price actually came out to being less than a pint of craft beer a week. Is that right? Absolutely. And you know, to be honest. 
why not have the craft beer while you're sitting there doing it? Although the only downside to that is I it's eight yes. o'clock in the morning, so maybe that's not the right decision. But why not have a beer, have a coffee while you're sitting there learning the stuff? I don't know. I know I, I know some guys that are definitely cracking a beer on the way to work. Absolutely. <laughs> or on the way home if you do don't do that. Shift. So, you know, I totally understand that. There's no judgment. But, yeah, maybe a coffee, crack a coffee, sit down and um, spend an hour with one of our awesome team, talk through those that fluid power stuff. They're interactive, so you get to ask your questions, um, you know, as, as it goes on, you'll find that you have questions, you start to find more questions that you want to ask, you find more situations that you want to discuss. So that's where that, that sort of face-to-face -face stuff. So it has been really hard. Yeah, I do love that you're doing it live as well. <clears throat> yeah. So it's interactive because we all know how freaking boring it is to try and, and to stay focused if you're just watching a training. Like your brain just squirrels off, your phone beeps, and it's like next minute you're gone. So having the live training and delivering it that way, I think is um, is the most impactful, and it lets you to yeah, because you something will pop up as you're going along. Um, so that's amazing. Yep. Um, so how long does the course go for? It's a 10 -week program, so it's an hour a week, ten weeks. Yep. Uh, you get to see the the recordings. If you if you miss a session, there's recordings there. If you want to send messages to us, you can send messages to us. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways to access us um, and ask those questions and get it all answered and, and get some really cool content. This is stuff that we deliver to our face-to-face um, -face courses, have done for a lot of years. Yeah, this is tried and tested content that we've been using for you know, over 10 years now. We just deliver it online mm. now. The online part, being able to talk to people is so much fun. You know, the guys were going crazy sitting here, locked away in the, like caged <laughs> animals. Let us, let us out at people, please let us get online. So it's pretty exciting for us to be able to spread our wings a little bit, so to speak, and get away from face to face, which you can hear in the background here yeah. is going on, and, um, and actually access people that are in totally different places and totally different jobs and you know, hear different yeah. stories. So for us, it's really, really exciting, but hopefully for everyone else, it gives everyone a really good opportunity to be able to access the training and, um, and feel a lot more confident in what they're doing beautiful i'll get the team i think the team's online listening to us if they can drop the link um to the registration page for that program into the chat um, that would be amazing and if you are listening along now we do run them regularly but each course is obviously limited because it is live so is as soon as you see it if you're interested like i said it's a no-brainer it's the price of a, a pint of craft beer per week and you can get yourself up level just click the link now and go through and secure your spot um, because that's something that, oh, there we go. There's the, there's the link down on the screen, guys. Make sure that you click it, uh, type it in and get your spot reserved because they guys can only handle a certain amount of people in the room uh, to do the live questioning. Um, so with that, Kyle, I some people need a little bit more help um and i know that we've got some uh certificates and like actual certification and other programs that if you are above the basics and you're kind of like you've listened to this day and gone i want to be the guy that's figuring out you know the the system that makes the right mix so things don't go boom or they go boom when they're meant to go boom um i think we can get if they just type in the word more <laughs> or help nope into the the chat box the team can reach out with a, a link to book a call with one of your experts hey and and to figure out what might be the next stage for yep. them even, even if you just want to talk through a, a problem that you're having with a machine on site happy happy to share some some happy. time and knowledge to get you moving on that and you know almost a mentoring type thing oh, amazing beautiful um now i know that there were some people that didn't make it on live today uh and probably from list, just listening to this, more questions have come up or they're going to go go and get on site and be like, ah, uh, shit, <laughs> who can I ask? Well, we can ask Kyle. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a second event uh, on Thursday the 21st of October at 9 a.m. Australian Daylight Savings Time um, so that if there is any additional questions, anything comes up between now and then, then we're here to answer that for them too. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll be here. One thing I would like to leave everyone that's watching and listening um, with is that, especially during COVID and times where we've been, you know, maybe given a bit more home time or not on site time and um, 
the opportunity to to slow down, this is a perfect time to upskill yourself. Uh, I've I've come from as as Kyle knows and any of my guys that are listening, I've come from a headhunting and recruitment background prior to moving into the the business coaching. And the one thing that I see is the people when the times get tough that get kept are the ones that are constantly increasing their own learning and have a growth mindset, whether that's that they're paying for stuff themselves or they're reaching out to their employers and saying, Hey, I want to, I want to round myself out. or I want to grow. I want to be a better uh, technician expert and the, the guru on site. So this is a perfect opportunity to make yourself invaluable, right? And to, to make sure that a, you're securing your job by, by, not messing up, <laughs> uh, but be rounding out your skills and, and making sure that you've got more tools in your belt to dish out that someone can rely on. So if you're feeling like, you know, maybe you, you've not been as hands-on lately and you maybe your hours have been reduced or things aren't as busy because you can't get to sites, rather than sitting there playing uh, Minecraft or just watching <laughs> or what, watching uh, YouTube videos. Oh, pussy cat. On, on pussycats let's let's ditch the pussycat uh videos <laughs> uh, and think about maybe you can invest how many like just on average is how many hours a week would some someone do um in the fluid power program so the, the 10 week program you really only need that one hour a week where you get to do that live session. Wow. and then yeah you know, all of yep. the programs ramp up some of our yeah the higher level programs you might be studying sort of four to eight hours a week um, on top of yep. any face-to-face -face time that you've got, just so you can get through it in a, in a reasonable amount of time. But it's anywhere yep. from just an hour a week to, to catch up all the way through to some bigger stuff. Yeah, and I can guarantee you guys, even if you think you're ridiculously busy, you can redirect eight hours a week if you choose to. And if you were like, okay, I want to get paid more because the, the opportunity once you've done the training, especially the certifications, to increase your salary is huge. Yeah secure your salary so you're not so you're not without one uh you can find eight hours i'm i'm absolutely 100 that if you if you say you can't then comment into the the box saying can't find the time or something to that effect and i'll send you my training on creating an ideal week so that you can fit the training in and upskill yourself absolutely <laughs> awesome um, Kyle, I think that the team's on board. We're going to be monitoring the comments. So even if you're watching on, on repeat, just feel free to interact, guys, and we'll make sure the team reaches out um, and make sure that we've got anything else answered for you on the next call. It's been great. What a ball. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thanks so much for sticking with us, guys. And, Kyle, thanks for sharing your knowledge. And more importantly, for always coming at this stuff with a whole lot of passion and thinking about the employees first. Yep, this is the fun. So, yeah. Awesome. Epic. Thanks, everyone. You guys have a great day.